All right. So uh, as you may have saw in the film, uh, my name is Eric Olson. I work for UW Extension. I'm based out of UW Stevens Point, which is a small comprehensive campus in the center of the state of Wisconsin. And my work basically involves working with lake associations and lake districts in the state of Wisconsin. Those are nonprofit groups and local units of government that essentially organize to take care of uh, Wisconsin's great treasure. And that treasure is meant to be represented in this image here of, of, of just one of our thousands of lakes in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, the lakes are very much uh, a, a piece of the identity of Wisconsin. Wisconsin uh, draws tourists from all over the region, from other states. It's an economic driver just having these tourists come. The lakes are also an important ecological resource. Uh, without these lakes, we wouldn't have the biodiversity, uh, the, the same fish and animals that we do have right now. And really for the people of Wisconsin, the lakes are a, are a touchstone. It's a very important place for people to go to relax and to rejuvenate um, and, and to basically do self-care and, and, and create family memories. Um, and so around these lakes, it's not surprising that communities begin to form. Individuals get to work together and say, let's solve some joint problems on these lakes. And our office, UW Extension Lakes, for 45 years has been working with these lake associations and citizens to really help them along, to provide resources to them and guidance and education. And one of those programs that we provide is called the Lake Leaders Institute. It's essentially an opportunity for people who are part of lake associations to step up and learn more about how do we successfully manage lakes, how can they better network with each other. Um, and every other year, we offer what we call advanced lake leaders. This is a program where the graduates get a chance to uh, come together across different crews or years of uh, lake leaders, meet each other, but also work on some sort of particular problem. And I got drawn into uh, Wisconsin Think Water School because I had this dilemma. I was wondering, what the heck am I gonna do with our Advanced Lake Leaders program in 2017? And what Jeremy was offering to us as sort of a value proposition was an opportunity to think a lot harder about uh, what your curricular intent is. What are you really trying to teach people and how are you trying to accomplish that? So that was sort of our, initi our, our initial draw into this or my personal draw. I also am working with other colleagues who do education with water organizations in the state of Wisconsin. And we were sort of uh, finding ourselves having a hard time getting the Department of Natural Resources staff to take on our perspective or to see these watershed and lake problems the same way we were. So we kind of challenged Jeremy and we said, well, what if we not only brought some educators as part of our team, but we also brought some resource managers, people who actually do regulatory uh, development for the DNR and also approve permits. But, and these people are mostly, they're not educators, they're engineers uh, for the most part. And we mix our, those two groups together. And Jeremy said, yeah, I don't know how that's gonna work, but let's go ahead and give it a shot. So I appreciate Jeremy for giving us uh, that opportunity. This just shows, you saw in the video previously, um, what our experience looked like. This is at one of the UW Stevens Point's northern facilities. Uh, and this, you don't, it really doesn't matter who our team is, except to say it was roughly half and half educators and uh, resource managers. Um, and so it, it did provide us just that, that time and place to sit down together and sort of work through what is our mental model of lake management and watershed management in the state of Wisconsin. And we really appreciated the ability to use the software provided through Think Water to sort of map out the system. And I think the engineers really enjoyed it because they got to see, okay, this is the way we like to diagram problems. We wanna see all these different parts. And we spent a little time sort of on what I call the right-hand side of the model up here, which is essentially your standard uh, watershed model that you develop to explain how stormwater moves, how nutrients move, water budgets for a system. It's really, de it's dependent on land use in a watershed, delineate a watershed and figure things out in, in, in what's going on in terms of land cover, soils, topography. You could add sort of your precipitation or climate factors, but generally that's gonna generate runoff, which is gonna impact stream water quality, lake water quality, and ultimately from my perspective, the quality of life in those places. If, if, if stream water quality is going downhill, if, if those treasured lakes are becoming uh, degraded, then the quality of life is going down. So we got, they really liked that, and this is really a simplification of our chart, but it would show just how you could break down land cover, soils, topography, they're all shaking their heads. And then we said, okay, but 
you know, if this is sort of that system and we're worried about the direction it's headed, we know that we can also intervene in that system, that there's a place for introducing best management practices or other changes on the landscape. We'll call them on here restoration activities. That has that red exclamation point on it. These restoration activities constitute really our hundreds or thousands of attempts to somehow check the movement of water, to slow it down, to encourage it to infiltrate, all the things that uh, stormwater and, and watershed management professionals want to see. And we had this aha moment, I think, in our discussion where we said, okay, we know these restoration activities are needed. How many, roughly, do we need? How much might that cost? And, and pose that question to the DNR folks. Think through, briefly, how expensive this might be. If you had to just design them and raise the money through the state income tax or whatever to pay for them, what does that look like? And they're like, no, that's just not going to happen. We're talking about swallowing up the entire state of Wisconsin budget and putting it into BMPs on the landscape. That's not going to work. And so myself and the other social scientists, we point out, yeah, and yet people are doing these things. People are voluntarily introducing best management practices. Local groups, these lake associations that I'm talking about, raise their own money. They have bake sales, they do fundraisers, they levy a property tax on the property owners, and they're raising all these resources to get more of these restoration activities done. Isn't that a good thing? It's like the engineers would say, yes, this is great. You know, we, we kind of take it for granted maybe sometimes that those activities take place. So then we started talking about what I call this lower left-hand side of the model. It's the capacity component of this. It's it's explaining how a community comes up with those financial resources or donated resources, materials and volunteer hours. Where does that come from? It doesn't just sort of poof, appear magically. There's something happening in that community. And we know across Wisconsin there's differences in terms of capacity. There's some organizations, lake organizations, that are raising easily a million dollars just through fundraisers every year. And they're mustering thousands and thousands of volunteer hours. There's other lake organizations that struggle to put together a board to help them just exist as a lake organization. So what we started to point out to the, to the resource managers is we have spent millions and millions of dollars understanding that biogeophysical chemical component of the watershed. We understand it really well. We've developed a sophisticated three-dimensional, even four-dimensional, once you can include time, models that explain and understand and we can test out how the watershed is going to change physically. We've spent almost no money on this community side, especially relative to the amount of money and time spent on the right-hand side of the model. So it's sort of our plea to the resource managers, hey, can we set aside some money now? Because there's kind of a, uh, you don't get the same return for each marginal investment up there on the right-hand side as you might get on the left-hand side. Because really now what we're trying to get is more of these resource uh, restoration activities. And these are going to come out if you can increase capacity. So we came up with sort of a, a focus then. It was like, oh, OK, so really for educational purposes, we want to focus on developing capacity. And we borrowed a framework developed in Minnesota, also developed in public health, that says, you know, there's kind of these four dimensions of uh, community capacity. It, it has a base of membership. And then it's about how do they organize internally, functionally, and how do the ex uh, organize externally? How do they relate to other pieces of the community? And ultimately, the, all those three things add up to, can they carry off programs? Are they doing anything in the watershed? Great. How do we educate about this? Um, we sat down and we sort of, we wanted to sort of MAC out this. So MAC is an acronym developed from the Cabrera uh, framework that says MAP, Activate, and Check. So what we wanted to do is essentially share this model with our advanced lake leaders then activate them to sort of engage in this model and think about how they, could, uh, how they could be involved in the model, really, and then check, find out, um, did, they, did it work at all? Did they learn anything? And one of my fellow uh, university folks, uh, the sociologist that you saw, Nels, from UW-Stout, he said, well, what I would do is I would just sort of make the students do the work. Like, I would just give them, set the table for them, and then let them run. And it's like, yes, that's a classic sort of, I think, extension way of doing things is to let people be the source of solutions. So we mapped out an agenda that just said, you know, we'll, we'll introduce the model, we'll, we'll get their brains going in the morning, and then in the afternoon, we'll basically ask them to tell us how do they increase capacity, whether it's membership capacity or programmatic capacity, organizational, relational. They'll take sort of a simple one-word sentence 
and create a recipe for us that then I can use and share with other lake organizations. So that was sort of our, our curricular design. This is just an example of some of our lake leaders at a retreat uh, in, in Wisconsin. Again, in the morning, we just wanted to get their, their brain uh, going. And then we gave them sort of different capacity components for each of those four parts and asked them to specify out, how would you do this? Or how do you do this? How would you explain to another lake organization how to do this? Um, and they were very <laughs> productive in this sense. They were able to spit out ideas. And, and we just, our role as facilitators was just to capture those ideas, diagram them out a little bit. So here you see, again, some of the lake leaders you know, we always try to meet in very beautiful places. Uh, this is, again, the Leopold Foundation uh, in Baraboo, Wisconsin, and just capturing what they tell us. Um, and then in terms of the check, what we do is after the first round of people creating a recipe of how do you do one piece of uh, capacity development, we would rotate and have another group look over their notes and try to critique it and give some feedback and maybe fill in some gaps or tell me, the facilitator, what part they need a little bit more explanation on. So this is just a whiteboard from that. And then our classic extension mission is to try to disseminate some of this as well. So we, we made a, a proposition or a promise to our, uh, our audience that we would start to share these recipes with them and we would start to cultivate or, or, or capture more of these recipes. We set up a web page where we can share out these results and that this curricular exercise, this method of capturing ideas, would just become a regular part of what we do in Extension Lakes. So we have a convention coming up in three weeks. We have people coming from all over the state of Wisconsin. They're going to go to a capacity development workshop, and we're just going to replicate this. And we can keep replicating it because in each of those capacity areas, there's many things that they, they are doing and that they can share with other lake organizations. I'll just give one tiny example of maybe what that looks like. This is sort of on the relationship capacity side of the equation. And we work with, this is a woman who's a, um, she's the president of a lake association in western Wisconsin. And they deal with a huge watershed challenge. They have a, a TMDL. It's one of the most uh, toxic lakes in the state with respect to blue-green algae. And every year it has a pretty uh, nasty blue-green algae bloom. And they realize that no way is their lake association at the tail end or the bottom of this watershed going to solve all the problems in their entire watershed but we invite them to think about how would you map out your network? What are all your potential partners out there? Who are the partners that you're already working with? So she just sat down and just started scribbling out all of the different connections that they had. So she was creating a map of her system of connections, her relationships out in the community. And then she took it upon herself to put this into a, uh, a PowerPoint slide that just showed, again, circles. You don't have to read what's in the circles, but just recognize that between state government, local government, other nonprofits, they have dozens and dozens of, uh, of communities that they interact with. And then our opportunity to them, and I don't know if this is going to be worth checking out, but we have this, uh, we have basically a, if you had the URL, if I could open it up, I, I would, but it basically took that into the mapping software because it's actually a really intuitive and easy way to create the diagram that she made on PowerPoint, which she can't share with other people, which other people can't edit, and she can't show very complicated relationships, like label the different types of relationships. But in the Plectica software, we're able to do that. And so that, even just that network analysis, we're going to begin using that as part of our curriculum and part of our outreach uh, with lake organizations, because they're not going to solve it together. Or they're not going to solve it alone. They're going to solve it working with other people. Um, so in, in summary, I think we had a really great experience with this. I just want to thank Jeremy and the Think Water team for providing us a little bit of time and space to kind of get into these problems. And I think uh, we're going to try to use these same approaches to all the other curricular material that we use in UW Extension.